Okay, welcome to week three, where we will be looking at the idea of dwelling and structures that serve sheltering purposes, as well as forms of communities we build around them. Um, so whether you're in Siam or in today, it's called Thailand, Papua New Guinea, Cambodia, or in the island of Mindanao, which is in the south of the Philippines, you might find that everyday dwelling share common structural features. Even from the images that you can see here, you can tell that they tend to be made, they tend to be made of wood and the roofs appear as if they're attached uh, using a type of leaf, normally the nipa, while the walls show different degrees of you know, openness and porosity. Some like the Papua New Guinea ancestor house that you see here on the upper right uh, with, really shows no visible wall at all. Uh, the boundary is really only marked by the shading uh, that the roof provides, uh, therefore between light and dark. While in the Mindanao example that you see at the bottom of uh, the image before, uh, typically it shows a veranda that skirts the front of a house, serving as a kind of in-between space uh, for greeting and entertaining guests, uh, while the, the quarters inside at the back are normally reserved for private use. Then there, there's the example of the Siamese house that you see on the upper left, uh, where we see a much more checkered texture when it comes to uh, the wall feature. And you could guess that these are weave mats that are used to form the wall of a house that incidentally rises above a body of water suggested by the figure who are uh, beneath the house, sitting in what looks like, you know, a boat. Uh, so whether they are wooden or plated built structure, another feature is that they are often raised from the ground, resting on still pillars that you can see amongst all the houses that I've shown here. And this is a typical typology uh, in a type of construction that is called the post and lintel. So post here refers to the vertical pillar or column, and lintel is the horizontal bar that or the platform that rests on the post to, uh, to, that makes the dwelling elevated from the ground. Scholars have said that the design uh, very often is a form of climatic response, namely to avoid flooding or the attack of wild animals or serve uh, ventilation purposes. At the same time, I think it is also important to think outside of the, what is called an environmental determinism to recognize perhaps the social dimension of such a myth. Uh, as a post and lintel construction uh, is something that is, can be easily sort of like assembled together without the use of nail. It is also something that can easily be pulled apart or taken apart uh, uh, simply by unlocking you know those sort of like interlocking features and therefore easily sort of like taken apart in a sense it allows the house to be moved or either be taken or either be taken down and reassembled elsewhere or carried off entirely by the village so there is a custom where it is called angkat rumah where people actually move the entire house but more typically you would sort of like take the house apart and then sort of like reassemble it somewhere else being on stilts, uh, it is a house on the move. Uh, and this runs across whether it's an orang asli house or a typical sort of everyday Malay kampung house. Uh, uh, there is a very vague concept of land ownership uh, in uh, this part of the world until the arrival of European powers. Uh, primarily because as we looked at, uh, discussed about last week, it is not only a seafaring or riverine culture, uh, it is also one where we're living in a, space, in, in a place that has uh, plenty of land and very often it is recognized that a cultivated land area would naturally fall under the ownership of the family doing the cultivation or at least it's not an I concept of ownership because all lands are owned uh, by either the sultan or anything but at least you have the right to be there. And if the land is abandoned, then it doesn't take very long for tropical vegetation to rewild a cultivated crop, a plot. And therefore, anyone who took 
over the cultivation or anyone who bothered to cultivate the land simply became uh, the new, uh, uh, simply assumed the right to use that plot or has control over that plot. Okay. Uh, so very often uh, you see today the Malay house then takes on uh, a shape that is more closely a, a resemble what you see on the screen here. So larger homes, these are normally larger homes belonging to a penghulu or the headman of the village. And they, they were the first to then sort of like start using shaved wooden planks. Uh, again, uh, yeah, it's assembled without nail, uh, typically resting on uh, pillars. And so like the, for example, in uh, Chinese cult, uh, in, in the Chinese built building tradition, there is, uh, you know, the, people resort to certain treatises or manuals, such as the Ying Tao Fa Si, uh, uh, where technical aspects of house construction are recorded and, and followed, right, and, and used as a sort of like guide. Uh, so in the Malay tradition there, is uh, similar kind of like treatises that have survived from the 19th century. Uh, and likewise, uh, a home is not just a physical dwelling space, it, is, it also has a spiritual sort of dimension, and the spiritual dimension connects the house to its larger kind of environment. So in Chinese, you, in Chinese sort of tradition, you have either the feng shui, feng shui or you have the lu ban jing as the principal guide or manual help you to understand the place of the house in relation to its spiritual nature. In, in the Malay tradition, there is the Taju Mulu, or uh, in Arabic, it's a corrupt, corrupted form of Arabic, uh, meaning the crown of jewel. Uh, uh, so all these are sort of like knowledge that puts the house in a very specific kind of spiritual, cosmic space. Uh, uh, and the house therefore needs to operate within a particular kind of grammar uh, for it to make sense as a house. Uh, typically, in the Malay world, this grammar begins with a point, and this point is the axis on which the house, which the house becomes culturally significant. So, if we think of the house as described, and if you have studied the diagram uh, in attach uh, in this week's uh, learning journey, you'll learn that uh, uh, the, the addition, how you sort of like uh, create additions to the house uh, is principal on uh, what is uh, called in linguistics agglutination, uh, meaning that you can add on uh, components and parts based on certain kinds of like principles but it needs to begin at, with the point. And this point really is the heart of the house. And it is called the Tiang Ibu or the Tiang Seri. And this is the spiritual heart. And it is normally recognized as the central column, even if the column itself is not marked out or distinct from other columns. Right? Uh, in this sort of like central column, very often uh, this is created by means of undergoing an elaborate ceremony, where the first component of the house is raised from the ground, forming a central axis through which the house expands and radiates outwards. So it is also a very gendered axis, and this is considered and connected to the feminine, and therefore described either as the ibu or the mother, otherwise uh, by the title, the Sri. Uh, who is also known as the goddess of the rice field. And this cosmology of the home is therefore uh, protective and nurturing. And typically, uh, the house comes alive when you activate the tiang ibu. And there's ceremony associated with it, where you put certain sort of like, you know, colored cloth uh, in during the sort of like uh, uh, erection ceremony, uh, alongside with uh, certain sort of like ingredients that uh, different different uh, ceremony master will prescribe uh, to to for you to sort of like raise up the particular column. So in this sense, even when you think of a house as something that is alive, a house is also something that can be abandoned as a result uh, having its having lived its life. 
So components are then sort of like taken apart in, during that instance and installed in the new house that one might build. Uh, so the house then really stretches all the way from Nias, all the way to the Polynesian uh, islands. Uh, typically, Polynesian sort of houses are on the ground, but uh, a remnant of this uh, uh, a tradition or history of building on still can be found in the kind of ancestral houses uh, called the patakas, that they, the storehouses that they still continue to, uh, uh, that, that is part of the built vocabulary of, for example, the Maori. Uh, and besides the house, very often, the house is then sort of like situated within a kind of larger social space. And this social space allows for the community to sort of like bond and bind and takes many different forms. So in the Nias Island, it's normally a square. Uh, and uh, the uh, Maori example that you see here on the screen uh, is the pataka or the storehouses that takes on a uh, power to sort of like bring people together and also get people to sort of like think of themselves as a community. And another example that I want to bring out to highlight the very often gendered space is the Ache, Ruma Ache. Uh, here, you learn that uh, from this very early depiction of what a Ruma Ache would have looked like from a very local perspective. You see that the women are the one that occupy the space of the home, while the men uh, gathers or outside of it and really around this smaller little house that is close by or attached to this larger home over here. So historically, the, uh, property is something that was passed down matrilineally in Archinese society, and women ruled the household. Men were the wanderers or the floaters uh, who were kept at bay, sometimes suspiciously so, uh, uh, especially from the running of the household. And typically, by the time the, a boy who grew up in a house, hits puberty, he will be sent out to this little boys club here uh, called Munasa or something like that, uh, where he will be groomed by other men to become men who would then sort of go off and try to find uh, a spouse and, and move into uh, the, the, the home of uh, the, the clubhouse that belongs to the person that he or she, uh, he intends to sort of marry. Uh, and so this is, the house itself has a very sort of like inter interesting sociological dimension that then reflects the social patterns of a particular society. And this pattern is often very different from how we understand relationships to work today. And typically our relationship is husband, wife, man, woman, children. The family is therefore a nuclear family. Uh, uh, if not, then the nuclear family belongs to a larger extended family. But uh, you find that uh, as we sort of like look at the past, uh, different ways in which people organize kinship and relationship, and that this is reflected in their lived environment as well. Paying attention to this also helps us to understand why houses are built in certain ways and what are its sort of features that makes it unique, distinct. Thank you. Uh, and as we've seen from the last example, there is this thing that sort of like sticks out, a little boys club, so to speak, right? And in other uh, Austronesian, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, this is often uh, a kind of in-between space uh, where the outside and inside will meet. Uh, typically, as we have seen from the Mindanao example before, it takes the form of a veranda or a kind of anjong where it's open out to nature, the walls are not entirely shut off, and this is where you greet visitors. It becomes a sort of like point where you come and entertain your guests, uh, and that's the last point where visitors are able to sort of like enter into the house. So in much more well-to-do homes of aristocrats uh, in Java, there's also, it's typically fronted by something called the pendopo, a pavilion-like platform where ostentatious performances are often uh, featured uh, here and, 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 uh, and it's ceremonial sort of like nature helps to sort of like bring communities together and therefore functions also as a community space. In another instance, as we look at a much more humble type of pavilion, and these are normally called the waka, uh, and these are platforms that would sort of uh, e exist or hastily very often built uh, community space along the coastline uh, in the east coast of Malaysia. 
and therefore dotted around the coastline, you find that these are platforms where people would gather in the evening, meet up, have a uh, talk to each other, and it's social life. And therefore, the pendoto, the wakaf, the anjong, often plays a sort of like social role and extends the house from its sort of like private interior environment to the outside world, a world where we live alongside other people. So the two other examples that you see here on the left is the Balinese house and on the right is a, a, a well-to-do aristocratic kind of Javanese uh, house design and layout. And even though these are not often built on stilts, uh, normally uh, they're closer to the ground, very often you find that the house is still built on slightly raised ground, therefore marking a kind of like distinction between the house itself as a space from the outside world. Uh, in other examples, and we will return to that later, in other example in the Toba or Bata uh, region in central North Sumatra, uh, we can see house in relation to a larger sort of like social space. And here the house is organized in rows in the example of the Toba Bata uh, with an open structured storehouse called the Sopo, uh, built in the opposite side that you see here. And therefore, the, uh, creating uh, a, a kind of like space between these two institutions, between these two structures. And this is the alaman, or in Malay, we call it the halaman, right? The front, the yard, uh, and serving clearly a social purpose. Uh, connecting the storehouse, which is the rice, uh, where all the rice and the harvest is, are communally stored, and the individual sort of dwelling places or families uh, belonging to that community. In the Karo example, however, it tends to take uh, the Karo Bata, it tends to take a much more circular sort of shape where uh, community life is organized around a ballet or a, a meeting hall uh, or the balai. Uh, 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 as well as the lesung, which is the rice pounding house, uh, while the houses then sort of uh, encircles these two major institutions. Uh, so we're now seeing how the, the house itself is not just a singular uh, kind of like a structure uh, existing on its own. It exists within a community and therefore participates uh, and, and it's in conversation with other kinds of uh, social institutions that make up the community. Uh, and this is uh, important because then we, ask, uh, we begin to see the significance of the house in relation not just to its uh, physical setting, but also that it contains a, a kind of like cosmic significance. And this is, can be seen very patently in the way decorations of sacred motifs often go into serving an important function of not just protecting the house and bringing life to the house, but also locating the house within a cosmos. It, the house sits not just within its sort of like physical reality, just its physical surrounding, it connects with this idea of space that is larger than itself, that in a space that we cannot see with our own naked eyes. And this space extends also back in time because this is a space that carries forth the knowledge from one generation to another. In this contemporary graphic rendition of what you are seeing here with a Donson bronze drum, it sort of uh, uh, it telescopes into this little motif detail over here. Uh, and uh, besides the significance of the ship-shaped motif, that was already discussed last week uh, within the Austronesian imagination. The inner ring of the bronze arm also contains uh, this shape over here that looks like a house with its distinct upsweeping roof gables on both ends that very much resembles the Bata houses that we just saw just now. And these Bata houses are located very much inland. They're not outside close to the coastline. Therefore, to have that this technology or this sort of like form surviving uh, all the way from uh, 600 BC to the present day. Uh, it offers us a way to think about cultural ex 
uh, inheritance differently uh, if we were to solely rely on oral history. So oral history, legends is one direction, but archaeological evidences then point to another possible evidence of uh, in confirming uh, or really clarifying, I guess, uh, what has survived principally uh, as stories that were passed on uh, and stories and knowledge that were passed from, uh, uh, from uh, by word of mouth, okay? Uh, Part of this uh, larger sort of like so social ecology uh, that uh, that we have looked at so far is that the house is more than cosmic. But here I like to focus on a very specific architecture, and that is uh, what is called the barn or the rice storage facility. So this is not just a social space, but it is a social space that allows one to demonstrate participation in a community through one's contribution to uh, the community uh, and typically uh, it is a kind of communal storage facility where uh, the fields that will work together as a community at the harvest is then sort of like shared it becomes a kind of like shared space that then binds the community together and this is something that is metaphorically explored in the curatorial theme of Ruang Rupa they are contemporary arts collective based in Jakarta uh, who were recently appointed as the artistic directors of the next documenta. And this is an arts festival held every five years in Kassel, Germany, and recognized as really one of the most important contemporary arts events in the calendar. And, uh, so I've included information about this in the extra that you can read about it, but typically in, uh, even in contemporary Indonesian discourse, uh, not just amongst the Rangrupa collective, uh, the Lumbung, uh, uh, as a dry storage sort of facility has taken on larger and larger significance as a way to think about how we can organize society, uh, as a way to think of the social kind of responsibility one is expected to perform uh, if you are a member of that community and how to think about living not just uh, in, in individualistic terms but in communal terms as well. Okay? Uh, therefore, uh, the Lumbung itself then connects to another important space and typically this is not so much a, a, a one particular built structure but a set of interlocking uh, almost uh, uh, space that is the pasar or the bazaar where trade happens and in Walter Schutten's uh, 1660 depiction of a market space in Batavia, you really get a sense of how lively this space is. This is a space of trade, and it is also a space that is social, uh, that where different kinds of social activity take place. So at the back here, what you can see, uh, if you explore this, uh, this set of drawings on the Rights Museum website that I have shared with you last week, and that you have looked at the Batavian um, uh, seen uh, a landscape uh, and studied it closely during the tutorial is that you find here for example there's a theater space uh, alongside different stalls selling different goods and different uh, produce uh, this type of market space is only one among the many different typologies that you see in southeast asia so um, other contemporary examples would be the floating market uh, and this is also uh, something that uh, you'd find mostly along riverine cities where produce are conveyed and sold on boats. Uh, otherwise, there's also the tamu in Borneo, but known to be a kind of a market that is organized often around the batu sumpa or the oaf stone. And this is a kind of oaf stone that was created during a peace meeting or a peace accord uh, from which uh, friendly relations between different ethnic communities or ethnic groups uh, is celebrated or marked by setting up a pasa around it. Uh, so the Ofun is a reminder of that peace agreement, the peace agreement from which emerges trade. Uh, and trade therefore brings common wealth to all parties who have undertaken the oath and honors this oath through coming together and sharing resources and exchanging resources with one another. Okay. Uh, 
when we think of sort of like social institution, another uh, example is normally found in the religious institution. If the market is a space of transaction, monetary and commercial transaction, the mosque or the temple or the church in the Philippines, for example, is a different kind. It provides a different kind of spiritual glue to the community. And this, is, this type of religious institution can be a mosque or temple or church, and it fulfills not only a pastoral role, uh, handling matters of religion, but they also serve a social purpose. Uh, in this example that you see here on the screen, you see men and boys arriving at a, an Achenese mosque for Friday prayers. But notice how there are no women in the mosque since it's primarily a very much homosocial space and women are normally uh, uh, in that culture, uh, in, in Achenese and even in Malay culture, normally pray at home in, conventionally. And, uh, uh, and because they own the home, the mosque then becomes a different ground where men could then meet and interact with one another. Uh, so the position and the accessibility of a mosque uh, is uh, therefore an important factor when assessing whether a mosque can serve as a, uh, as a space for Friday prayers. Right? Here we see a Malay track uh, by Syed Uthman dated to 1893, if I'm not wrong, uh, where he rejects the recognition of new mosques in Palembang as a Friday mosque. Uh, and so there, there is sort of politics that is involved in the placement of these institutions, uh, especially one where uh, 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 it can represent uh, a community or the social unit on the whole. Uh, so the display here shows the different numbers of configuration indicating to what, what are the circumstances where a new mosque may be considered as a Friday, Friday prayer mosque. So the Friday prayer, Friday prayer is the, typically the most important prayer uh, in the weekly sort of like uh, Muslim calendar. And therefore, if the mosque was allowed to perform the Friday prayer, it means that it is a significant enough social institution uh, within a particular locale. And so therefore, if, uh, for example, in the first, uh, in the first uh, frame, uh, you see, you know, it's uh, two communities separated by sea and therefore justifies that uh, both communities should at their own individual uh, mock Friday mosque. And if you look at the bottom two frames, if the communities or the village are connected in some ways by a bridge or by ferry, then it is only justifiable to have one Friday prayer mosque. Uh, and typically, this is based on the number of people that can uh, attend the mosque. Uh, I, I don't remember what's the exact number now. Uh, so uh, again, what this goes to sort of uh, simply show is how uh, design itself really contributes to uh, uh, the thinking of uh, the social space and how people think of themselves as being part of one community versus how they think of themselves as being uh, separated from different other different communities uh, within its sort of vicinity. Uh, the last kind of uh, social, the last kind of like uh, uh, structure that we want to talk about that is typical in this part of the world is the istana or the palace, right? So it's uh, an indication of how colonized often we are by European ways of seeing, uh, not just here but really all over the world. When we really, uh, what we continue to do is adopt a kind of facade focused imagination of what constitutes splendor and grandeur, and grandiosity, okay? And this even informs the way we reconstruct or reimagine historical palaces such as Malacca, uh, a palace that was raised to the ground after the Portuguese conquest in 1511. So today the palace uh, it becomes a symbol of a lost golden age, and over time it has uh, taken on increasingly muscular proportion. What you see here, this is how it looks like. Uh, this is a particular rendition of it. And this is a much more recent contemporary uh, uh, reimagination of this, uh, this uh, destroyed palace, uh, where what you see here is an increase in sort of like desire to project European courtly grandeur, uh, that, uh, where focus is on the monumentality of the building. Uh, where, uh, and this is simply by giving it a sort of like uh, uh, Islamic spin to it. So you have, uh, you know, the roundels here uh, with an Islamic, uh, with sort of like Arabic calligraphy uh, to say that, okay, this is, 
and Islamic values. But then it takes on the shape and form and the sensibility that is very much uh, European and very often from an 18th century sort of a European sensibility where monumentality equates to power. It's a very Baroque kind of like thinking of power. Uh, but if you look at historical evidences of what the traditional palace might look like, we have some indication of this from Winstead's description of a ground plan uh, of a pal Ferrat palace, uh, sometime recorded in 1910. Uh, we see here what we, uh, uh, what we see here is uh, it is an interesting kind of like a gradated series of space, and it takes one ceremonially into closer proximity to the center of power. Uh, in this way, when we think of space this way, it's less so what is in front, but actually how it is ceremonially sort of like structured as a graduating series of space where you are able to perform a kind of ritual display of intimacy with the source and center of power. Uh, uh, in the person of the sultan, right? And, and how close you are to it uh, is uh, conducted through your ability or, or, or you giving the permission to pass through these spaces. Of course, the, the, the inner chamber itself really is uh, reserved for the sultan and uh, his, uh, his family and the con his concubines, okay? Uh, a modern hybrid of this can be found in the Jugra Palace uh, that was built in 1875. And typically, it is studied for, you know, what is in front of it, how it's, uh, its facade, where it takes on clearly very much uh, European uh, sort of like design and sensibility and characteristics. Uh, but if you were to sort of like look at the plan of this particular palace, you'd find that uh, it is structured also uh, according to a uh, a sensibility that's rooted in a much older tradition. So there is the public kind of component, and then there's the semi-private component uh, from which you graduate it into. And finally, the private area at the back where the sultan uh, and his family resides in. Uh, right? And so therefore, in thinking about uh, this, uh, 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 the, the typical sort of like uh, structure of the palace, uh, and the ritual and ceremonial purposes itself, uh, we're seeing a different, uh, we're really sort of like needing to reframe or our way or reorientate our way of thinking about what makes the palace monumental, what makes the palace uh, significant, or what makes it even beautiful. It's not its scale or its monstrous, its monstrous scale. It's the way we think about the movement and circulation of people as part of a larger kind of uh, 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 ritual, a, a, a larger kind of like ceremony uh, where display and performance play a huge role in uh, the way the palace is designed. So in this case, then the belayed manungu or the, or the waiting room then leads to a kind of like uh, uh, audience hall and then sort of like leads to uh, more inner chambers where uh, private discussions can be held leading to offices where decisions making are then sort of like deliberated upon. Uh, another beautiful example is the home of a prince in, uh, currently abandoned in Chungano. It's called Gura uh, Tanjung Sabtu, belonging to uh, Tengku, uh, the late Tengku Ismail. And uh, uh, so closely, it's very, uh, it's situated along uh, uh, further inland, uh, close next to uh, the river, the main river in uh, Chungganu. Uh, normally, typically, you could even sort of like take a boat up to Tanjung Sabtu, which is the kampung that serves this particular uh, palace. Uh, uh, it, as a result of its close connection to the kampung, the palace was also a social institution uh, that supports the kampung in terms of promoting its arts and crafts, as well as other activities. Uh, and notice how, what makes this palace unique or interesting, it's not it's, impo it's, not it's imposing or frontally sort of like imposing uh, kind of like a, a, a grandeur. Instead, 
you, you know, I think there is a kind of stateliness that comes not just from the symmetry of how each unit are interconnected uh, or, or that it fans out like a wing uh, on both sides from this center of sort of like unit over here. Uh, in many ways, there is a lot of similarity between, uh, you know, how we think of uh, Japanese palaces or each, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, and, and what we are sort of seeing here, where spaces are all interconnected, where buildings are interconnected, and there are sort of uh, connecting passages uh, that serve a ceremonial purpose of graduated revealing and demonstration of favor. In a way, we can therefore think of a house as possessing a kind of bahasa. And the term bahasa here is used not only to describe a language, but it is also used in, uh, in the context of its second meaning. And that is, uh, bahasa also means manners, uh, or a type of grammar that one can learn, uh, or to put it another way, a language of conduct. Houses built in a certain way then possesses its own bahasa, its own sensibility that makes it a, that makes its beauty sort of like unique and on certain terms, uh, and therefore to understand that it really helps us to understand that the house doesn't play a role uh, that is solely responsive uh, to its environmental factor. Uh, there are also sort of cultural considerations that you need to uh, uh, think about and consider as you understand its sort of make and design, uh, in order to understand why uh, uh, the design principle functions in a certain way and what sort of like social context it serves. Okay, we'll stop here for uh, this part of the lecture. In the next, uh, ep uh, in the next uh, section, we will look more at the different kinds of urban forms in this